Welcome to Planet Raconteur, where we who tell stories rule this world. I am Yuck Nasty, and I am your guide into our world that's filled with sights and sounds, both wonderful and frightening. Frightening, frightening. Filled with sights and sounds, both wonderful and frightening. Frightening. Palindrome by W. Sean Arthur. Mike pushed through the door, closing it carefully behind him. It was cold outside. Evening, Joe, he said. Bar was nearly empty and silent, but for the tinny voices of a pair of yahoos calling the hockey game. Mike glanced over for the score. Few patrons studiously avoided his eyes. For a moment, Mike just sat. He was so tired. Tired of cleaning up everybody else's screw-ups. Tired of unraveling their twists, their tangles, and their snags. He was tired of time guard. He nodded at Joe. Joe grimaced, but poured out a small glass of whiskey and slid it across the bar. Bushmills, the good stuff. One shot was all he needed. After all, he was a professional. Smoke drifted across the bar, stinging his eyes, and Mike blinked as he patted his sidearm. Mike then leaned back, reached for his gun again, and looked down the bar at the man he'd come to find. Well, said the man, I guess that's it then. A time guard always gets his man. I suppose the only way out is to kill you. It's too bad. You remind me of me, in a way. Only one of us has a gun. Mike patted his sidearm again. True. So, you making a move or not? Man cocked an eyebrow. Not. For the moment, anyway. Time here is messed up good. Could go around several loops. Maybe in different directions even. Yep, the man said. Palindromic time snag. Not much fun when you're stuck in it. Feels like going backwards. Except things are happening differently. It's like being pushed through it. Damn it. Not again. Palindromic snag, hell. He could already see how this was going to go. All the types of time snags Mike had seen since joining Time Guard, the recursive, the crab-like, anagrammatic. Man, palindromic was the worst. It was so damn confusing. And too often, the only way out was to shoot the guy who started the snag. He was licensed to do it, but it still made him uncomfortable. While would-be time travelers were idiots, it was hard not to feel sorry for them. There was always something tragic they wanted to reverse, never realizing that the past could never be changed, that trying could only lead to endless thickets of time snags. He sighed, and then the hairs on the back of his neck stood up. He recognized that feeling. Damn it, said the man. Not again. Yep, Mike said, palindromic time snag. Not much fun when you're stuck in it. Feels like going properly backwards. Except things are happening differently. It's like being pushed through a knot. For a moment, anyway. Man frowned. Time here is messed up good. Could go around several loops. Maybe even in different directions. True? So you making a move or not? Mike cocked an eyebrow. Only one of us has a gun. The man gestured at Mike's sidearm. I suppose the only way out is to kill you. It's too bad. 
you remind me of me, in a way. A time guard always gets his man. Well, that's it then. Mike leaned back, reached for his gun again, and looked down the bar at the man he'd come to find. One shot was all he needed. He was, after all, a professional. Smoke drifted across the bar, stinging his eyes, and Mike blinked as he patted his sidearm into position. He nodded at Joe. Joe grimaced, but poured out a small glass of whiskey and slid it across the bar. Bushmills, the good stuff. For a moment, Mike just sat. He was tired. Tired of cleaning up everybody else's screw-ups. Tired of unraveling their twists, their tangles, and their snags. Tired of time guard. Bar was nearly empty. And silent but for the tinny voices of a pair of yahoos broadcasting the hockey game. Mike glanced over for the score. The few patrons studiously avoided his eyes. Evening, Joe. Mike pushed through the door, closing it carefully behind him. It was cold outside. This next story is for all of you authors out there. (laughs) I believe that you are the only ones that will understand. This is the story that devours itself by Michelle Munzler. This is not a regular story. This is a hungry story built of words with tongues of glass and cracked marbles for eyes. You think you know this story. You think you've heard it before, but you haven't. It only sounds like the one you know with its crunch, crunch, crunching of plot laced bones and its smack, smack, smacking of fat story lips. There used to be characters in this story, but they were the first to go. Swallow down its story gullet. Two of them screamed and declared their eternal love for each other. The third one merely laughed and vowed one day to return. There also used to be a setting. Not a very good one, mind you, but solid enough to serve its purpose. That too was eaten. Mashed into a paste of generic trees and endless airports and washed down with a maudlin shot of rain. No one misses that setting, though. Or the characters, if we must be totally honest. Certainly not the story. Certainly not me. To be fair, the story has tried to create as much as it has eaten. Sucked sugar off three act arcs until his head near exploded. Molded fleshy outlines to show off to its friends when its friends still visited. Only to debone the outlines hours later and watch their skin slough uselessly to the floor. Once it even tried dialogue, A casual hello left adrift to the void where its apartment had been a week earlier. 51B, in case you were wondering. And no, nobody responded. The story also tried to liven things with mood and tone, with analogy and metaphor. It clung to rocky cliffs, peaked and pitted by tongues of salt while seabirds wheeled tirelessly overhead. It heaved beneath the weight of olive trees bowed with fruit, sweet oil dripping down its back. But that too is now gone. It's all devoured. Most everything that made the story what it was, that told it what to be, all the bits chomped and chewed and swallowed into an over-masticated mush. Very little remains of the story now, just two simple elements, its hunger and me. I must admit to being a bit selfish at this point. I've argued with the story for days about the importance of narrators. Without us, a story can no longer be a story. Somebody must tell the words, must provide perspective, relay the wishes of the story to the world abroad, right? Yeah, of course I'm right. I'm the narrator after all. 
and I know my job better than anyone. But I saw the way the story eyed me last night. I saw hunger giggling in its ear while they both drank cheap wine created just for the occasion. The story didn't make wine for me, not even an empty cup. And now I have another invitation to visit the story tonight. It told me not to bother bringing a gift, to just bring myself and don't be late. I tried declining, I did decline, but the words were swallowed before they left my mouth. Consumed by the story's desire for completion, for resolution. So here I am, despite myself, all dressed up and only one place to go. The story is king after all, and nobody, not even this poor narrator, can refuse that. The end. This is part two of Ignore and Dr. Finkelstein by A.C. Salter. The ancient cupboard creaked open on rusty hinges, releasing a coppery smell with the hint of smoldering weasel moth. But as he leaned closer, his nostrils picked out the more pungent smell of magic the arcane aroma of an all-consuming, formidable, ancient power. It reminded Ignore of the peppery tang of moldy mouse droppings. It tickled his nostrils and curled the wiry hairs within. Ignoring the unpleasant feeling creeping down his spine, he gathered all the required ingredients. And be careful, Ignore, with those troll salts. Carefully balancing the thang on the finger and the pouch of dust on the rune book, he hugged the bowl of salt under his forearm and returned to the workbench. The nursery rhyme finding his lips once again as he hummed the merry tune. He ceased when he felt the master's glare upon him. Now spread the salt evenly around the crystal, Dr. Finkelstein directed, reading from the book of runes make a complete circle and leave no gaps ignore did as instructed biting his tongue in concentration as he climbed around the wooden slab very good now place the finger to the north of the circle and the fang to the south the doctor commanded shaking his head as ignore set the pieces down wrong picked him up and placed them correctly it's my fault. I forget that you are full of bliss. Mm, forgive me, master. No need, Ignore. I created you, so the fault lies with me. After the crystal has bestowed its power upon myself, I might grant you with higher intelligence. Although, this may be more of a curse than a gift. How I often wish I could experience your mindlessness. Anyway, I digress. Pass me the fairy dust. Ignore watched in awe as his master held the book in one hand while pouring the fairy dust with the other, making swirling runes around the circle while chanting an old spell. It had been an interesting year after Dr. Finkelstein decided to research the occult a decision he came to after realizing that everything he invented or created had failed. There was a flaw with all he put his hands to in the modern world of man. So his interest began to lead him into the darker arts. He visited the elders of the arcane library of magic and spent two months locked in their deepest vault reading books, tomes, and scrolls from around the world. He had gathered information about a powerful genie that had been trapped in an amber diamond. A power that could be harnessed by only the cleverest, most brilliant and daring of men. Of course, the doctor realized that this was he himself. It could be no other. The rest of the year had been a tumultuous one finding the crystal itself, making deals with witches and wizards on how to extract the power, trading and dealing with warlocks for spells, and scavenging the tools needed. 
Ignore viewed how the fairy dust glistened and sparkled. It was beautiful. Yet he was sickened when the master explained that the dust was made from grinding down the fairies themselves, which he had captured in the Ferozian forest. Every part was used except the wings. Those he kept on display on the wall, each perfect set pinned to a frame board of felt. When the lightning forked across the night, it lit up the flickering shadows making wings appear as if they were fluttering. Concentrate now, Ignor. It's almost time. Connect the silver wire to the top of the diamond and be careful not to disturb the ruins or the salt. Yes, Master, Ignor replied as he lifted the silver cord which was attached to the pole that rose out of the laboratory. Rain ran down the shaft in swift rivulets forming silver beads before splattering onto the floor. On the end of the wire was a screw, which he inserted into the top of the crystal holder, the silver thread brushing the uppermost face of the diamond. It sparked a memory. He had something important to tell the master. But Master uh, Wade, I must tell you. Not now, Ignor. Can't you see that the moment has arrived? Look! Ignore craned his head back as far as it would go, the stitches in his neck straining as he gazed up where the doctor was pointing. Thunder roared through the heavens, sucking the wind from Ignore's chest. Then the sky flashed once again, bleaching the world white before throwing it into darkness. Now stand back and watch history unfold. Observe, my loyal servant for I am about to gain the powers of the genie. But, Master... Silence! Ignor slammed his mouth shut, his single tooth biting through his tongue. He tasted blood, the same viscous fluid which dripped from the wound in his palm where the tip of the crystal lay buried. It's fine, he told himself, the single thought bouncing around the bliss inside his head. I can always tell the master afterwards. Patiently, he watched as the doctor, still balancing the book in one hand, placed the palm of the other beneath the diamond. Pain twisted his mouth as he pressed his hand up into the sharp crystal. Then, forcing his grimace away, he began to recite the spell from the old pages. Genie trapped within the stone... I release you from your crystal throne. Your power is what I demand. Bestow it to me through my hand. Ignore leapt with fright as the laboratory exploded with light. The pole began to shake violently as lightning surged down the shaft. The metal screamed in protest as the charge carried on through, following the path of the silver thread before infusing inside the diamond. The crystal brightened like a lamp made from the sun itself, forcing Ignor's eyes shut, yet he could still see the terror unfold in silhouettes through his eyelids. The fairy dust spat and bubbled as the runes began to swim in circles around the salt. The fiend's fang vibrated as it spun clockwise while the finger began to turn in the other direction. <laughs> it's working! Dr. Finkelstein said so excited, his maniacal grin widening as the crystal grew in size, breaking from the device before rising from the bench, the master's hand pressing into its sharp underside. A fierce wind tore through the chamber, picking up speed along with scraps of paper and dust. The jars and bottles along the various shelves rattled and bounced creeping closer to the edge. Rain and hail cascaded through the open roof, pelting the room with small balls of ice, shattering glass, stinging Ignor's bare flesh. <laughs> it's working! It's working! The doctor continued until the crystal suddenly drained of light. The spectral of power flowed out of the diamond, draining it of color. 
Ignor felt a tingling sensation in his hand, and when he raised it to the front of his face, he saw that his entire palm glowed amber. It's... nothing is happening. The doctor turned his head to regard Ignor and the strange phenomenon that had enveloped his hand. His face contorted into a grimace a toad might give before being fried alive. He then let out a dry sob. Oh, God, no, I can't believe this. Oh, no. Oh, no. His words were suddenly crushed as the damaged crystal exploded showering him in shards of glistening splinters. Dr. Finkelstein's body, along with the salt, fairy dust, finger, and fang, were flung against the wall, the god cycle being knocked over in the process. Ignor stared at his master's unmoving body and the laboratory detritus that lay above his limp form. He wished to go to him, but he was held firm by an unseen force that gripped his entire being, squashing him from all sides, including from the inside out. I bestow my power onto you, came a calamitous voice as thunderous as the elements that cracked the night. From genie to man, from crystal to hand, the genie said, reverberating from deep within Ignore's chest yet he witnessed no body to go with the voice. What is thy wish? Wish? Ignore spluttered, his swollen tongue flopping around in his mouth, squirming like a fat slug in a tight sock. Yes, you release me from my prison. Now I may grant you a wish. There was movement beneath the pile of broken shelves and twisted apparatus as Dr. Finkelstein struggled into a sitting position. <laughs> Ignore! <coughs> Choose whatever your heart desires. But I have no wishes. Please, my master desires the power, not I. Only you must choose. Make your wish. For the power only lasts with the storm above. Ignore cast a glance into the sky. The rain had begun to wane, along with the thicker clouds. He hadn't much time. Oh, what have you done, Ignore? The master groaned, trembling hands probing his damaged face and scalp. The wish. The genie demanded, a subtle irritancy riding in his words. Please, I have... Wait. Ignore muttered, a rare idea coming to him. He knew what he must wish for, what he must ask for. It was quite obviously the only thing which he desired. A wish that he was more than sure that his master would be happy with. I wish... He said, feeling more confident. That the master and I swap roles. That I have his vast wealth of knowledge, and that he have my vast expanse of emptiness, so that he may enjoy the innocence of bliss. The bodiless voice began to <laughs> chuckle. As you wish. Ignore. Oh, ignore. It's all right, master. Ignore reassured giving him a thumbs up, or thumb up as he only had one. He would have said more, but the chamber began to shake violently as a maelstrom of rain, glass, and broken furniture began to whirl about in a frenzy. His body was drawn towards the tornado, sucked closer by the ferocious energy, as was the doctor. Raising his hands in front of his face for protection, he was lifted from the ground and spun. Ignore's world became a dizzy vortex, limbs being dragged one way, then the other, as he tumbled end over end. A peculiar thought surfaced in the emptiness of his mind. The image of the outside world, a place he had no experiences of, 
it was swiftly followed by another. This one of joy, an emotion that was alien to him, that was born of his first invention that worked. The hair on his flesh rose in mottled goosebumps as more thoughts and memories sprang into being, all whirling around the confines of his head more ferociously than the tornado that danced with his body. Happiness, glee, stars, moons, loss, sorrow, hate, failure, graveyards, death. The storm that raged in his head ceased with the storm that seethed inside the laboratory, and he fell to the ground with a thump. As the object settled around him, he heard the chuckling voice of the genie taper off until it vanished completely. The wish had been fulfilled. Gazing about at the mess around him, he became aware of an ugly creature that sat on the floor. Short and squat, its face was a crisscross of hideous stitches. The skin itself pulled tight and puckered in the wrong places. Opening its mouth, it wet its broken lips and moaned. There was no more intelligence coming from it than from the grunt of a dying pig. Ignore offered it a sad smile as he lifted the broken goggles from its head. Master? He began. But now his highly intellectual mind told him that he could no longer call the man before him Master. But what should he call the being that was formerly Dr. Finkelstein? Bliss, do you understand me? He asked, but was greeted with another moan. Slack features staring up at the moon as it appeared through the broken clouds. Ignor clambered to his feet and dusted himself down. He was happy to find that his new clothes consisted of a smart, comfortable pair of breeches, high-quality boots, and a silk shirt bristling with lace beneath a velvet waistcoat. Very dapper, he mused. Then giving his hands a second glance, he noticed that his missing thumb had been returned. The aches in his body had vanished, along with the stitches that held the patchwork of his mismatched pieces together. Hmm. Hey. How delightful. <laughs> he sang in a rich, baritone voice, feeling a flow of divine ecstasy pulse through him. He crossed the chamber, flung the door open. Fresh air washed over him as he held his arms out to embrace his freedom. Ignor had never stepped foot out of the castle grounds, and he was itching to begin his new adventure around the world. He placed one foot in front of the other, thrilled not to feel any pain with the movement. Then a moan from behind him made him pause, swaying on unsteady legs, one being longer than the other, was his former master. You should be delighted, Bliss. This is what you've always wanted. I'll be gone for a while. Possibly a long while. Possibly I'll never return. In the meantime, you have free reign of the castle. But I must warn you that you shouldn't go having any thoughts. Thoughts are dangerous, and you don't want too many of them fluttering around in your empty head. They'll chase away the bliss. It's not what you would have wanted. Bliss moaned. Whether he understood or not, Ignore couldn't say. Might I suggest that you try a pickled bog sprout? You are, of course, permitted to have a little joy in your life. <laughs> and leaving his rich words echoing in the laboratory, Ignore strode away to fill his head with the world. The end. Well, there you go. Another trip to Planet Raconteur. On behalf of myself and our other two fine raconteurs, Papa Dave and Bobby Anthem, we would like to thank you for listening. All of the stories presented on Planet Raconteur are used by permission or are in the public domain. 
check out the show notes for the details on the authors, their websites, and their other releases. Hey, much love, and thanks again for visiting the Planet Raconteur.